Hi everyone, welcome to tutorial 53 of our introductory Python for image processing tutorial series. In the last couple of tutorials, we looked at uh, how to perform uh, you know, image segmentation by simple thresholding. And we looked at both binary and also multi-class segmentation using multi-ortsu. Now in both of those cases, we were looking at the histogram and then just setting up limits in terms of our thresholds for image segmentation. So that's definitely a great way of segmenting your images provided you can segment them or threshold them using the histogram. But most of the time, you do not have that luxury. You probably have an image where you can see that things are going on, but then, uh, but then when you look at the histogram, the histogram looks very uh, similar for both regions that you would like to segment. So in such cases, you have to use other techniques to quantify whatever the behavior is between these two different regions. So texture oftentimes becomes one of these uh, uh, features. For example, if you have regions full of uh, you know, uh, cells versus clean area, or you have, uh, if you're a geologist, you have a bunch of clay versus uh, clean uh, hard material, which looks very flat under microscope, right? So you tend to see a bunch of texture. So how can we use this texture to segment images? And this tutorial is all about uh, at least understanding one way of uh, approaching or achieving that task. Now, first of all, texture, the English definition of texture is, it's of course a noun, and the feel, appearance, or consistency of a surface or a substance. So this is what texture is. Now in image processing, when we talk about texture, it's, it's, it's actually characterized by the spatial distribution of your intensity level. So if you look at here, this specific image, you can tell that, okay, in this region, this is very smooth. In other words, there is no texture or minimal texture in this region. But if you look at this uh, region on the right and left hand side, there is highly textured regions. And this is a wide field image, by the way, light microscope wide field image, uh, which is a single slice of a, uh, of a mini, of a time series that's actually corresponds to scratch assay analysis or wound healing assay analysis, but this is just single image. Let's look at single image first, okay? So this is what texture is. Now, how can we segment this image? If you look at the histogram, the histogram, the pixel values right here and the pixel values here are very similar. You cannot just set a threshold and then separate these two. So somehow we have to quantify the texture and then extract a texture map of the same region. For example, if I have a way of quantifying this texture and say, okay, plot wherever you have high texture area, plot it, you know, give it a high texture value and low texture region a different value, then I can immediately look at that and say, okay, this is uh, an, a, a useful image for segmentation, right? So that's exactly, again, the plan. So uh, how to quantify this texture? There are quite a few texture detecting filters, but let me just talk about the two or three primary ones. Yeah, starting with the variance. First of all, if you look at this image, you can clearly see that if you look at the variation in the pixel values, there is not much variation going on here, but in this case, there is a lot of variation going on. Although in this region, it, it, it tends to be microscopically a bit smooth right there. So I'm not sure if variance is a great, uh, a metric, but again, variance by definition, you know, uh, quantifies this type of, uh, you know, um, non-uniform behavior. So again, uh, uh, I think uh, most of you know what variance is. Again, it's the expectation of the square deviation of random variable from its mean. So uh, we'll look at it mathematically later on, but uh, this can be a good indicator of uh, texture. Now, Entropy is another metric. Entropy quantifies disorder. Again, if you have physics background, you know what I mean by, what we mean by entropy, right? So entropy is, uh, it's mathematically, I mean, it's, it's uh, if you know Boltzmann's equation, it is entropy S equals K, which is Boltzmann's constant, log of omega. And omega is, again, uh, uh, it, it has to do with total number of pixels and all our total number of, uh, you know, data, for example. Anyway, entropy quantifies disorder. Again, we don't need to learn physics for this. It helps if you know, but again, it quantifies the disorder. So I think it's also a good metric to quantify texture. And uh, in, in fact, if any time you have any texture, the best uh, function, the best feature extractor, I should say, is called Gabor convolutional kernel. Please learn about Gabor. In fact, I'll record a video 
exclusively only about Gabor. This is not just one filter. I mean, here when I say entropy, this is one calculation, right? Gabor kernel is given by this equation. Again, don't be intimidated by the equation. We are not going to look at any of this, but think of Gabor as a function, of course, of your pixel x and y, but more importantly, it's a function of wavelength, angle, phase, standard deviation, and gamma, which is the aspect ratio, okay? Uh, now, what do we even mean by that? By changing these lambda, theta, psi, sigma, and gamma, you can generate a whole different digital filters. These are all images of different digital filters by varying these values. So Gabor, Gabor convolutional kernel is basically an equation like this where it generates different features. So uh, you can actually generate infinite features or infinite uh, filters to uh, apply onto your image. And that's exactly why Gabor convolutional kernel is a great uh, kernel for traditional machine learning. If you're trying to do machine learning based image segmentation classification, let's say uh, uh, using random forest or support vector machine, again, we'll do that. Uh, please wait a few more videos. We'll actually talk about machine learning, okay? But Gabor is a great uh, you know, way of extracting features. So, uh, and, and this is also a very good texture detecting. But the problem with one single image is you don't know what combination of lambda, theta, psi, sigma, and gamma is going to give you the best image. That's why it's great for machine learning, but may not be good for single filter applications. Okay, so that's the quick background. Now let's actually jump into our spider IDE to actually look at a few lines of code. Starting with uh, these lines again are basically the libraries that we are going to import. Again, we are going to import uh, uh, the uh, pyplot for plotting, scikit image, import IO for reading images. Same with CV2, OpenCV. Maybe there are some functions in there. And I'm also importing threshold Otsu, Otsu based thresholding. Again, I talked about this in the last couple of tutorials. So let's go ahead and Im import these. And then let's also import the image that we are trying to uh, segment or uh, you know, apply our texture filter onto. So this is our uh, image. And again, this is basically, if you look at plt.imshow, this is m as, no, not as gray, cmap equals to gray. So let's go ahead and plot this image so we can, uh, Let's go ahead and run this. And if I go to plot, this is the same image. So this is the input image. And our goal is to separate the smooth region from this uh, specific region where we have some texture. So we can kind of, uh, in a way, calculate the area of the smooth region, right? I mean, in this application, we're trying to see the area of the smooth re uh, region versus this, uh, you know, compared to the textured region. Okay, so we looked at variance. And uh, again, there is no standard variance filter, which came as a surprise to me because I was searching for any variance filters, uh, but there is no, because it's not used in image processing that often. So I kind of wrote three, four lines of code to kind of calculate the variance, basically using the formula, right? I mean, you calculate the mean and then square of the mean and variance is the square mean minus the image mean squared. And I put a K size or the kernel size of seven to calculate this and uh, as patches, okay? Otherwise you get one single variance for the entire image. So the whole point of this is run a seven by seven patch and calculate these means, okay? Run, uh, go through this code and see if it makes sense to you. Okay, so I'm going to plot this and I'm not spending too much time on this because I know this is not very useful, but I really would like to show you. Uh, how this is. So again, this is uh, a seven by seven patches, so you can see the variance. And in general, there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you can see, the problem with this is you see a lot of variance right there, not much variance down here, right? And it is seven by seven patch. So it's picking up a lot of features from this edge, and then at edge, the things change. So it feels like there is some variance going on there. This is definitely not a useful image. So let's not spend any more time on that. Now, when it comes to Gabor, it's a great filter for texture, but like I mentioned, if we know the exact parameters, then it makes our life easy, right? So again, Gabor is, what is Gabor? It's a function of uh, lambda, theta, psi, sigma, and gamma. Now, if we know what the right uh, functions, then we can easily get it. So I, I, I'll give it a try. So 
Here is the equation. So where is Gabor available? There is a reason that I was importing OpenCV. Gabor, get Gabor kernel is part of OpenCV. So go ahead and do that. And then you have to apply a kernel size. Okay. And let's do uh, a K size of 45 for now. Okay. And you'll see what happens, what the implications are when you change that. And then five, theta, 10.9 and zero for these values. Okay. For lambda, theta, psi, sigma, and gamma, I fix those values. And then uh, my K type is CV. Uh, this is basically what type of output would you like? Okay. I want uh, uh, in, uh, uh, unsigned integers, and that's how you uh, provide it. And this is just defining a Gabor kernel. So up to this point, we just defined what it is. Now we have to apply it. So when I do this, it's actually generating one of these. Okay, maybe it's generating that. And let's apply that onto our image. And how do we apply that? Again, the way you do that is cv2.filter2d. Again, I talked about this when we talked about a few videos ago about convolution. Okay, so you apply this filter as filter2d where onto your image using what using this kernel that we just generated okay using the kernel we generated and by the way here this is 32 uh, floating actually and now i want uh, unsigned integer 8 the output as unsigned integer 8 okay and go ahead and show the image so let's see how the output image looks like with these settings that's not bad huh you can see my uh, theta is pi over 4 Okay, it's at 45 degrees this way. Now, if I change this to pi over two, let's see how that looks like. Again, I'll spend some time on the board later on. You see, that's now 180 degrees right there when you do pi over two, right? So this gives you an idea, pi over three. So the filter is aligned in that specific direction. So again, we are changing the theta here. So the filter is either horizontal, diagonal, and all that. So I think you got the point here where the direction depends upon the theta and all the intensities and other completely depends on other parameters. So uh, this can also be used. In fact, this is not a bad uh, uh, output. You know, Now this region is kind of separated from this region, but I still need to quantify uh, what this is. I, need, I still need to figure out a way of separating this region from this. For that, Gabor is not useful. Now let's get to the most useful part for segmentation, okay? Entropy. This is very, it's available as part of scikit-image.filters.rank. I don't know why it is available there, but it's there. It's called entropy. And I'm also importing something called scikit-image.morphology. From there, I'm importing disk. Disk is it's basically creating a kernel with a disk size of whatever we are defining. And why? Because we want to apply entropy with that kernel, okay? With that kernel size. That's the reason. And how do you apply it? Very simple. Again, bulk of the work, someone else did it, provided the library, and we are using it. So once you import these two right there, now we just need to generate an entropy image by applying this entropy that's available here onto our image with a disk size of three. You can change the disk size to see how it affects on your image, okay? So let's go ahead and uh, apply the entropy. Now let's view it. When I go ahead and look at it, you can right away see that, okay, I have high entropy regions versus low entropy regions right there. Now, what if we apply a Otsu-based thresholding onto this image, not the original image, but this image? Now it should uh, be able to find a minimum that uh, allows us to separate this high entropy regions from this. Again, this may sound a bit tricky if you're new to image processing, but what I'm doing is two-stage uh, segmentation. One, generate another image that uh, reflects the first image. So in the first image, we are quantifying the disorder or non-uniformness by generating an entropy image. And now we supply the entropy image to Otsu. So Otsu can separate this region from this region, okay? Again, if you're new to image processing, this may sound like a, uh, some sort of a trick, but you'll get used to it, okay? So uh, first of all, let's have a quick look at the histogram. We did this in the last couple of tutorials. Let's, uh, uh, and by the way, I'm looking at range zero to five because I looked at my variables for entropy because I don't know what is the entropy value. And if you look at the entropy image, the values actually, I looked at the maximum, it looks like the maximum is five. So let's plot a histogram right there. So as you can see, these are all low entropy regions. These are all high entropy regions. So let's try to separate them. Uh, instead of manual, 
I mean, it looks like it's around 2.2, 2.3, right? I mean, right around there. So let's actually go ahead and apply threshold uh, Otsu onto my entropy image, not on the original image. Again, it, it's going to fail if you apply it on your, uh, well, it'll pass, but it'll give you a value that would be useless. So let's apply this onto our entropy image. Uh, so let's look at what it tells us. So it's telling me that my threshold of 2.13, yeah, if you go back, I said 2.2, apparently 2.13, somewhere around here, is a better value to separate these two, that's it. So now that we know that, let's you can use a digitize like I used in the last tutorial, or uh, since this is only one uh, value, we can go ahead and say, okay, my binary image is basically my entropy image with all the values less than or equal to threshold, right? Because high entropy, more disorder. We want the region with less entropy, which means less than or equal to threshold. So let's go ahead and plot it. Extract that and also plot it. So now if we look at the plot, there you go. Now we separated the high entropy region or the cellular region. Of course, go ahead and play with the disk size to see if you can get rid of these uh, features down there. So if we change to disk size of five, let's see how that looks like, okay? Um, let's go ahead and do it all the way to down here. Oh, I have to plot this again. I mean, it's getting slightly better, but you got the idea. So this area is very nicely separated from the cellular region. Now, once it's uh, separated, now I'm going to say, okay, my scratch area is, uh, I'm converting this into a NumPy array by saying, uh, you know, uh, let's go back so you understand. My binary right now is a Boolean false or true, right? Because we applied a threshold. Now, when I do NP, dot sum binary equals to one, it's actually summing up all the pixels where uh, my values are true right here, okay? So this line is nothing but, okay, look at my binary image and wherever the value equals to one or true, this is Boolean, right? It can be one, it can be true, you can use either. Wherever the value equals to one, uh, add that and tell me all how much, how many pixels do I have there? That's all this is. Now let's go ahead and print it. So the scratched area is 34,331 square pixels. That many pixels do we have there? Now, if that's not useful, I mean, if you want to convert that into like square microns, you just need to know your pixel size. If my pixel size is 0.45 microns per pixel, then uh, my scratched area is nothing but the scratch area in pixels multiplied by your square of the scale, right? This is area. So you have to multiply by square of the scale and that should be it. So my scratched area in square microns is 6,952 square microns. So let's build on this in the next tutorial and actually uh, read in a whole bunch of images like as part of time series and then plot our scratch analysis, uh, you know, graphs, which is area as a function of time, uh, which is nothing but our scratch essay or wound healing essay. Okay, so thank you very much. And again, please subscribe to this channel so you get automatically notified whenever new content gets uploaded to this YouTube channel. And thank you for your attention. Let's meet in the next tutorial.